Hi, everybody. My name is Diana Ginsberg. I apologize for the delay. I had a computer blip just as I was beginning. My, I am the CEO of Olam, which is a network of over 50 Jewish and Israeli organizations that work in the fields of global volunteering, international development, and humanitarian aid. It has been our honor to partner with the Office of the Chief Rabbi and Tzedek on Benazai since its inception. Um, we are going to open this evening with some brief remarks from Chief Rabbi Mervis, and then we are really honored to have an intimate conversation with Right Honorable David Miliband, who is the President and CEO of the International Rescue Committee. Um, it is now my real privilege to uh, turn the, the floor over to Chief Rabbi Mervis, whose vision and leadership drives not only the Benazai program, but the Benazai ethos, a real commitment to social responsibility in the British Jewish community and beyond. Thank you so much, Diana, for those very lovely and kind words of welcome. Good evening, everybody, and how tremendous it is to see so many alumni of our four groups of Ben Azai participants. And of course, a very special privilege for us to welcome the Right Honorable David Miliband. Today, we start a special month in the Jewish calendar. It's called the Omer. We will be engaging in the absence of public celebration. For the next month, no weddings, um, no uh, music to be played in public and so on. And it all goes back nearly 2000 years to a time when in the days of Rabbi Akiva, a plague broke out amongst the Jewish people and uh, 24,000 students of Rabbi Akiva perished. And the Talmud tells us that the reason was it's because they didn't react and conduct themselves with honor towards others. Right now, we are very sadly uh, enduring a pandemic. It's a plague within our societies. Unfortunately for us, unlike the period of Rabbi Akiva, when there was an absence of consideration for others, the pandemic, in some respects, is bringing out the best within our society. So I was uh, mentioning my visit to Idomeni, and in preparation for that visit, um, I needed inspiration and, and I needed information. And uh, I turned to David Miliband, and uh, as expected, he was absolutely extraordinary. A man of incredible experience in government, knowing how to deal uh, within the world of NGOs, um, being absolutely passionate about consideration towards others. And in his capacity as the president and CNO, CEO of the International Rescue Committee, uh, he is somebody who devotes his entire life to helping others, to saving lives, and to empowering and inspiring others to do the same at a global level. Uh, it's absolutely breathtaking to see what he, what he and his organization does. And therefore, in gathering together the alumni of Ben Azai, for us together to have inspiration uh, to continue with our important work and our vision for the future, we could think of nobody better than David to join us this evening. And David, thank you so much because you so readily agreed to our invitation uh, and uh, we are so touched and privileged and have been looking forward immensely to this opportunity to sit at your feet, to hang on to every one of your words and to take your messages with us in our work in the future. The most important thing for me uh, to do here is to introduce our incredibly distinguished guest, and to thank David Miliband for honoring us with his presence here this evening. Well, Chief thank Rabbi, you I'm so much. Touched by what you said, and I promise you the privilege is mine, but I also want to um, 
repeat something I said when we were in the green room before, that it's not just uh, Diana and I who are going to be doing the work this evening. Um, I'm very much looking to learning from your Ben Azai um, fellows and uh, alumni. I hope to, I, I, I agreed to do this, not just because it was you, although I would have agreed uh, because it was you, but I always like to do events where I'm going to learn something. Thank you so much, Chief Rep. I um, really appreciate your beautiful opening remarks. And I, I will just take this opportunity to um, fill in a little bit about David Miliband's um, illustrious bio so that you can have a sense of who you have the opportunity. Enough already. <laughs> I'll just give the headlines, I promise. Uh, so as we mentioned, President and CEO of the International Rescue Committee. The International Rescue Committee um, does respond to the world's worst humanitarian crises and helps refugees and displaced people in more than 40 countries around uh, the world. Um, what many of this call may not know is that the IRC or its predecessors um, were founded in the early 1930s, um, inspired in part by the request of Albert Einstein and originally um, helped those who were fleeing Nazi Germany, which um, may connect to some of the personal stories of those who are on this call. Prior to being at the IRC, David did serve as Foreign Secretary of the United Kingdom, driving advancement in human rights and representing the UK around the world. And before that, as uh, Secretary of State for the Environment, where he pioneered the world's first legally binding emissions reduction requirements. So that'll just give you a taste. Um, so I hope that the wheels are turning in your minds in terms of questions that you wanna ask him. Uh, David, we would love to start by just learning a little bit about you on a personal level. I know that you have written and spoken about the fact that you are the son of Jewish refugees who fled to Britain um, from continental Europe during World War II and its aftermath. And I'm curious if you could reflect a little bit in what way have your own personal values and family story inspired your work? But on the flip side, in what way has your current work given you some insight or increased appreciation for who you are and your family story. Well, thanks, Diana. It's great to be with, with you all. And of course, when you say to a British person, I'm going to ask you some personal questions, that's the most terrifying um, introduction that one could ever uh, imagine for a, for a British person. Um, I, I hope the following resonates with some of the audience, that my, I was born 20 years after the Holocaust. Uh, my parents, my, my dad was a refugee from Belgium in 1940. My mom spent the war in Poland uh, in hiding and uh, came to uh, the UK in 1946 as a 12 year old on her own. And um, my parents really shielded me from the kind of trauma that they'd been through. So I was not a child or, or, or a teenager or a young adult who was brought up to believe how lucky he was that he was, he had the chance to, 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 to exist. Um, I, I had an assimilated experience, I would say, rather than a, an experience that hammered home to me that I was the son of refugees. Um, but I always had a very strong sense that my parents were, were foreigners. They'd come from a foreign country, um, my dad spoke with a, a, a slight uh, foreign accent. Um, he, he spoke foreign languages. His first language was Yiddish, actually. He spoke very good French because he was brought up in, in Brussels. So, it, so English was actually his third language. And it makes me especially proud when people say that he was a really good lecturer. When he's, he was a teacher, professor. And uh, people say that his, um, he was a magnetic public speaker. And, I remember talking to him about that, and he, his explanation was that because English was his third language, he actually worked quite hard on his text as a lecturer. He didn't just go in and and wing it. He he had a a strong feeling that he had to work he, he had to work at it. 
Um, and often, if you see, it, it, there are a few pictures left of him as a teacher, and he, he's often got notes there. It's not just um, off the top of his off the top of his head. So I, I think that um, I, I had this on the balance. On the one hand, we, we lived in London and in Leeds when I was a child, and uh, in the UK, we lived in it for a year in the United States. Um, my, my parents were not uh, um, were not observant, so. Uh, I didn't have the that. Uh, in fact, my grandparents weren't observant either. Um, so that would that that aspect of my heritage was denied me, if you like. Um, but on the other hand, I had a sense that we were from a family that was a, had a little bit of a different story than many of the people who are my pals um, uh, growing up. And so I feel and. and, and it's interesting when I think about myself as a member of parliament, I never felt people were looking at me and saying, oh, there's David Miliband, the Jewish member of parliament for South Shields. Uh, they, uh, I never had a feeling they were looking at me and saying, there's David Miliband, the Jewish foreign secretary. They might have thought, uh, there's David Miliband, he's the Labour MP for South Shields who's Jewish, which is a, a different way of thinking, but just in my, um, in my assessment, um, that uh, that sense that I was um, uh, I was an MP who was Jewish rather than a Jewish MP felt quite important. Now, as I've got older, and I think also as I've lived in the United States for seven years, I've been very struck how um, the fact that at my job interview for the current post I had, I, I said. I was interested in becoming CEO of the International Rescue Committee because one, it was trying to tackle some of the world's biggest problems. Two, it was a relatively unknown organization that deserved to be known better. But thirdly, my parents were refugees. So I was closing a circle in a way um, by doing, by taking on this task. Um, that's clearly struck a very, it strikes a very strong chord every time I say it speaks to motivation, which I think is a very important aspect of leadership that um, is sometimes neglected. And maybe a, a habitual hazard of, of those of us who are British is that we underplay. I mean, it, it's, it's nauseating when people over, overplay their identities, but it's um, we, we may be, be underplayed. And so I, I've become I, I've become conscious, I would say, in the last seven years about the extent to which that part of my story is interesting to people and relevant to the work that I'm doing today. And so I, I would say it's more important. To what extent has it reflected back to what it has done made me think about my story? I mean, I wrote a book called Rescue Refugees and the Political Crisis of Our Time. And I, I did say in that that when I thought about um, people in Iraq who were fleeing from death squads, uh, of course, I thought about my mother or my grandparents. And so it has been a, a, a time of reflection. And the fact that the Holocaust generation is passing away um, uh, has heightened something I said um, 12 or 15 years ago, even, that for those of us who are of my generation, we're a transitional generation, old enough to have known those who survived the Holocaust, but young enough to live beyond their, their lifetimes. And we have a special responsibility, I think, to not just tell the story, but learn the lessons and uh, uh, put into practice some of the um, facets of survival and um, what it means to build a good society that I think were, were, were tragically lost at that time. And obviously, I could spend the next, the whole of this discussion um, answering that question. So, but let's make it more interactive than that. Sure. Uh, so you mentioned that the first reason why you took the job at IRC is because you wanted to work on some of the most challenging issues in the world. Can you just give us a snapshot of the current situation nowadays related to refugees and displaced people? Maybe some of the big picture numbers, some of the numbers people may not be aware of, um, and some of the stories behind the numbers. I'm actually looking at the people on this call and there's someone here who was my teacher on some of this, um, which is uh, Moses Seitler, who's working on refugee issues in the oh. UK. And I'm sure that there are others as well, but if you could bring us all up to speed. He, he probably knows more than I do, but just, to, it, it, I will answer that, but let me just give you an, uh, two or three of the things that are on my desk today. 
because I think that begins to make real what it means to be the CEO of the IRC. One, Myanmar has hardly any banking system at the moment. So I'm trying to figure out how do we pay our 600 staff? Um, and I'm, we're working on it. Two, I've just come out of a meeting with our research and innovation team. They're working on, do you know this idea of nudge behavioral insights? where you're trying to work with the grain of human nature to get to achieve public policy goals. They're, they're working on how do you use behavioral insights for teaching and for tackling sexual violence and a range of other um, issues that we uh, deal with. Uh, thirdly, um, I, was, um, I was in a budget meeting, of course, today. So it's a fact of life. If you're the CEO, we're, we're a nine, we, we think we'll be a $900 million organization this year. We've, we've grown from about $450 million over the last six years. So we're all, we're, 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 we've had the Trump years were very tough, but we've survived the Trump years and we're, we're taking off again. Um, but I've also been um, uh, doing some work today because I'm sitting on the WHO's independent panel on pandemic preparedness and response. And so we're thinking about the global system for uh, pandemic preparedness and response. So, so those are some of the things, just in terms of the direct answer to your question. Um, we, we're unusual among NGOs in that um, we now have a very focused mission. We help, we, we exist to help people whose lives are shattered by conflict or disaster, survive, recover, and gain control of their lives. That's how we end up working in 40 countries, 200 field sites. We're not trying to boil the ocean. Uh, we're not one of these NGOs that just chases the money. We want the money to be chasing us to, to, because of the impact that we, uh, that, that we have. And the problem we're trying to solve is very easily uh, defined. There are 35 million people today who are either refugees or asylum seekers. That means they've been chased from their own homes by conflict or persecution, and they've crossed a border. There are 45 million people who are internally displaced people. They are people who've been driven from their homes by conflict or persecution, but have remained within their own country. And there are 235 million people who are in quote unquote humanitarian need around the world. And as an organization that works, and humanitarian need is important because if you're in a war zone in Yemen or in Syria today, but haven't moved, we care about you're within the IRC's remit because your life is being shattered by conflict or persecution or disaster, but you haven't yet moved. And so it's important. Where are those people? Um, there are 20 countries on our emergency watch list. I hope some people will Google this after the meeting the IRC 2021 emergency watch list. That's the 20 countries where we expect humanitarian need to grow this year. Um, those 20 countries account for 88% of the 235 million and 84% of the 80 million, the 80 million refugees and internally displaced. And that 80 million figure for refugees and internally displaced is, the, is more than 1% of the world's population. That's the first time since 1945 that it's been that uh, number. And it's concentrated in places like Syria, uh, Afghanistan, um, important South Sudan, um, Bangladesh, because of the flee, people flee the exodus from uh, Myanmar, the ethnic cleansing that happened, that, that happened there. Half of this population are under the age of 18, and about 60% of them live in urban areas, not in camps. So many, if many people think that refugees live in camps, they don't really anymore. And um, finally, very importantly, uh, about 85% are in poor countries, not in rich countries. If you follow some of the discussion, you'd think that Western Europe and America are suffering a flood of refugees, quote unquote flood, I don't really like that word, um, but quote unquote flood. Um, no, it's Ethiopia, Uganda, Jordan, Lebanon, um, Bangladesh, who are far more likely to have refugees than the UK or the US or, or even Germany, which has taken more asylum seekers than anyone else in the last five years. Thank you. Uh, I'm going to ask two more questions and then we're going to open it up. Um, you didn't so, tell the uh, audience there's going to be a test on these statistics at the end, so I hope they're taking notes. <laughs> um, the Ben Azai program is grounded in. Jewish tradition, but has a broader call to step up and be involved in, in larger issues around the world. And so one of the questions that I am curious about is what is the role that faith plays, positive, negative, anywhere in between, in the global refugee crisis and in the potential to solve it? 
Um, that's an interesting question. I think, I mean, it's also interesting for us institutionally, because we were set up, as you said, to uh, rescue 95% Jews from occupied Nazi-occupied Europe. Uh, our far, first office was in um, Marseille when it was occupied by the Nazis. Uh, 2,000 fake passports helped people, including Marc Chagall, to escape from occupied France. Um, but uh, at Einstein's instigation, we were set up as a secular organization, not as a... Um, faith-based or uh, uh, faith-inspired organization. And today, probably 45 or 50% of our work is in Muslim-majority countries. So it's an interesting um, change. Now, um, I think that um, if I think about the humanitarian sector as a whole, um, division that is the product of religious difference is a big driver of conflict today. Um, a significant proportion of it, either within Muslim majority countries or in countries where there is strife um, over uh, religion, somewhere like the Central African Republic, uh, there is a Christian Muslim divide of increasing ferocity and uh, drama. Um, in terms of the response, um, Institutionally, um, there are important faith-based organizations that, are, that respond in the United States. One of the refugee resettlement agencies is HIAS, the Hebrew Immigrant Aid Society, which is a what they call in America a storied organization. Um, I, I should have said uh, to you, Diana, earlier that, and I think there's a bigger lesson here. If I if I might just do a slight diversion, not just a sort of um, advertorial for the IRC, but I think this is important for any of you who are involved in uh, NGOs. When, when I arrived, the IRC said that it worked for refugees and others. It said that it um, changed lives and saved lives. And it said that, um, and it said nothing about where it worked or what counted as success. And we've been through a really rigorous process of asking, who do we serve? Where do we work? What counts as success? And you can Google IRC outcomes and evidence framework and you'll see exactly what our country directors see. Because if you're not clear about who you're serving, where you're working, and, and we have entry and exit criteria to guard against mission creep. And I think that's really, you know, really important. And I should have said that for us, we now work, we, we, we're very clear, we work across the arc of crisis. That phrase, people whose lives are shattered by conflict and disaster, that takes us from the war zone to the places within a country that's at war, whether there's conflict where people have fled, so internally displaced, refugees and asylum seekers next door, and then refugee resettlement and integration as the ultimate step as people start new lives. We do that in America. We're the largest refugee resettlement agency in America now. And we also have a large program, interestingly enough, in Germany for resettlement of asylum seekers or integration of asylum seekers. So um, in, that, in that world, there are some faith-based organizations like uh, HIAS, um, there are also some global anti-poverty organizations like World Vision. And there are obviously uh, millions of people who either work for us or support us who, who are called to make a difference by their faith. And um, that's an important uh, motivator, I think, for some of our staff and some of our um, supporters. But I think it's also, it would be wrong not to hide that, that we are dealing with the consequences of friction and conflict over religion, not just the benefits of a religious uh, calling to, um, to make a difference, which is what's so inspiring about the Chief Rabbi's program and, and all that uh, many of you are, uh, are, are, are doing. And, um, yeah, that's, that's, I think, the fairest answer to your question. And my, my last question before turning it over to everybody else is um, that piece about making a difference. So over the course of your own life of service and your career, you have served in government, you have served in the nonprofit sector. Um, the people who are the alumni of Benazai on this call are 
either currently still university students or at the beginnings of their careers. What would you say to your 21, 22, 23 year old self, knowing what you now know um, in terms of making a difference? What are some lessons you can share from your own leadership journey? Um, I mean, I was pretty stupid when I was 21. I, um, I got a Kennedy scholarship to go to the Massachusetts Institute of Technology to do a master's. And I was, a, I was stupid because I was a young man in a hurry and I thought it was good to do it in a one year rather than two. And it would be much better to have taken two years to do it. I would have had money. It was such a fun thing to do. I, I sort of, I thought I had to rush back to the UK to save the Labour Party. Um, and uh, there were plenty of other people trying to do that. And I, I think they could have spared me for another year. Um, I think that um, the second thing I'd say is I, I, I've obviously had the chance to see that in government, you have much more power than you do in an NGO, but in government, you face many more obstacles to getting anything done than you do in an NGO. Uh, in government, you're looking at things from the bird's eye view and the danger is you forget the people. In an NGO, you're, you're starting with the people. The danger is that you forget the, the global picture. Um, in terms of um, uh, not exactly advice to myself, but things that I think have been important to me. Um, always do a, only do a job for as long as you're learning in it. Whatever you're doing, you, you've got to be learning as well as doing. I think, um, secondly, I haven't been good at this. Keep a good address book uh, because uh, the world's a world of networks and uh, those networks uh, are important. I think um, thirdly and, and importantly, and uh, I think um, thinking time is a much underestimated, not quality, but uh, carving out thinking time is an underestimated virtue. And some people think by retreating to think on their own, that's not actually how I do it. My, my thinking time is actually interactive with, with people who, I'm, uh, who I learn from. And the, the reason that I am seen to be someone who's an energy giver, not an energy taker, is that I'm always trying to, um, th to, to find space to think. And I think that's a really, really important thing. And sometimes you have to force yourself to think. So just one thing that, when I, I, I when I do when I know in my bones I've got to think through a hard problem I commit to giving a speech about it and the audience doesn't have to be big or small but the fact that you're putting your words out there it's a forcing mechanism to to get you to get your thoughts in order and you don't always succeed but it's, it's really important there's a final thing that I think is really I didn't I've only learned this and it's, you can do your own diagnosis of it. But um, I had this really interesting experience of, um, of a group of volunteers. We have volunteers from the AmeriCorps program who help our US offices. And I was having a meeting with the New York office and one of, and I asked them to introduce themselves. And one of the volunteers used an acronym about some, one of the services that we're providing. And I said to her, what does that mean? And she said, well, you're the CEO. You should know what that means. And I then said, yeah, but do you want a CEO who pretends he knows what an acronym means? Or do you want a CEO who's willing to ask you a question because he thinks he might learn something from you? And she said, OK, fair, fair, fair point. She told me it was community case management. And um, I think that I always say to our interns who come in, there's only one rule in our office. If ever you've got a question, make sure you ask it. I mean, find the right time to ask it, but never be afraid to ask a question. And I think that's that's important. People are often afraid to to say to, to ask questions because they think it'll reveal their ignorance. Um, it's far more important to ask questions. And frankly, if the person who who you've asked it to looks down on you because you you, you and makes a judgment about you because you asked a question, then more fool them really. But I think that's a really important rule that. Um, you, 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 you want to build a culture where anyone feels um, able to ask a question and you've got to start that, you've got to role model that from the top, you've got to show it's not a, it's not a mark of ignorance to ask a question, it's a mark of wanting to learn something and I think that's quite important.
Hello, uh, hi, I'm Dave Dov. Uh, nice to meet you. I am on the project delivery slash project management fast stream in this little service uh, at the moment. Uh, thank you very much to the Chief Rabbi, the Office of the Chief Rabbi, and to David Miliband for this talk and for organising it. Uh, really, really interesting, uh, really valuable, and really uh, very like personal insights and very relevant to us, I guess, as well. And so, really appreciate it. Um, I'll just ask more technical, uh, maybe mundane questions of creating the governance. So the context is, is that I'm thinking about becoming um, a trustee of a charity that I'm passionate about. And I noticed that you are both president and CEO of the IRC. And I've kind of wondered what's the distinction between those two roles in the IRC? Um, and why do you, what's the value in you holding both of them? Um, did, which department are you end up? Uh, currently, actually, just been seconded to the Metropolitan Police for six months. Oh, interesting. Good. Um, I, I have no idea what the significance of it was. That was the job they advertised, and I've never bothered to ask, actually. It's quite a, it's kind of interesting. I mean, I think that um, in America, the corporate governance of chairman and CEO in the UK is separate, is, is split, is not split in uh, the same way in America. Um, some organizations have a a president CEO split where the CEO is effectively the COO, the chief operating officer. Um, and the president is a kind of more of a chairman, chairman uh, figure. Um, I didn't invent president CEO to show that all power leads to me. I promise you that wasn't the uh, thing, but I, I actually never bothered to ask. Um, and I'm trying to think whether some of these sister organizations, I think, a few of them have a similar... Um, I could have brought the question there. into more just, uh, you know, what are your opinions on government structures, charities, what works well, um, you know, and how does it differ from the private yeah, sector? I mean, it, so there are two things, just to keep the conversation from get, getting too long. I mean, a lot of the charities are what are called federated organisations. So they're sort of Save the Children UK, Save the Children US, Save the Children India. We are not a federated organisation. We are more or less a unitary organisation. And... Um, I think that makes for, um, uh, that's a blessing, to be honest. Uh, it, if you're having to negotiate everything in a federated organization, um, uh, that, that, that's, that's very challenging. Um, I think that, uh, secondly, I'll say a couple of things. The, the governance versus management divide is really important. If you're going to become the trustee, don't think you're going to become the manager. And things often go wrong when the governance management dividing line is blurred, you want to be, you can, you, you want to keep it clear because if you have to sack the management, you want to not have been managing. Uh, and so I think that's a really fine line to, to tread. Um, I think that um, thirdly, the, um, the balance of functional expertise and generic skills is a really important thing on a uh, on a uh, governing board you want people who really are good at reading the financial runes you want people who are good at the legal side the audit side you also need to make sure that you've um, got some people who are just passionate about the issue sounds like you are thank you Lauren, you're up next. Thank you so much for that very engaging talk and for the, um, obviously the Chief Rabbi for putting this event together. Um, I've, I've been, um, I went to the uh, UN uh, Women's Conference online and was very interested about what you were saying um, with your work that it kind of leads to uh, refugee resettlement and integration and kind of thinking you know of the arc that you were talking about um what I mean d does um does your organization work to kind of see if uh, the refugees can have kind of a role and a voice in kind of um conflict resolution or I'd just kind of like to hear your thoughts on if the if the art could be a kind of a more a more circular shape. Great point. Um, I mean, you're asking. 
do we swim upstream to try and tackle the causes? And the, the simple answer is no. But um, I, 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 we did spend some time a couple of years ago exploring what it would mean to try and do so, because we're dealing with the symptoms rather than the causes. And there is a crisis of peacemaking and peacekeeping at the moment, the crisis of diplomacy. Um, this rather takes me to my former life as Secretary of State, um, as former Secretary. Um, when, uh, and what's happened is the tools of diplomacy for relations between states have shown themselves to be inadequate for diplomacy to tackle civil wars within states. Because at the moment, there are more people fleeing conflict, but there are no wars going on between states. There are wars within states. And that's what's causing the mismatch. Um, and the truth is, it would, it would be dangerous, I think, for our staff to try and swim upstream and put ourselves into the tackling of the root causes. Uh, we can we, we can do a little bit at ground level. We can do a bit on peace building, but it's it's a, it's a frustration because the only real solution to this refugee crisis is to is is to build political systems and institutions that include rather than divide. Um, it's interesting you went to the women's conference. Um, I hope this doesn't put the cat among the pigeons. But I said that we can't be a successful humanitarian organisation unless we're also a feminist organisation. And the reason I say that is that gender inequalities are absolutely fundamental to the situation of the clients of the International Rescue Committee, not just that more of them are women than men, but the women suffer two, three, four times the inequalities of the men. They suffer um, from um, systems, inequalities of power that are absolutely fundamental to the lives that they lead. And our, my argument was that unless you're willing to recognize those inequalities of power that exist within the sector and within the organization, as well as within the communities that we work in, you're not going to be able to develop remediating programs that tackle the symptoms. And so um, we try to live that out in our work, and we expect it to be you know, our male colleagues like me, as well as our female colleagues who have to carry the torch for that. And that's been, I think, a an important change in the last 20 years that what was our gender-based violence program and became our women's protection and empowerment program was something that our, our female colleagues were, were expected to carry the water for. And now I think it, we're trying to make it clear that it's a it's part of all of our responsibility. Thank you. Um, George, I saw you had a hand raised before. Yeah, thanks, Diana, and thank you, uh, David, and uh, Chief Rabbi as well. I wanted to go back to something you were saying in the first question about your personal motivation, um, because like one of the key parts of the Ben Azai program is not only to learn about the technical side of um, of various global issues, but also to learn about how to communicate about them and inspire action as ambassadors after the trip and in general and in our future lives. And you're talking about um, uh, how Jewish history and your family history has been uh, a driver of, of you wanting to work in this particular area. Um, uh, and I think there's kind of a paradox within Jewish history. Um, and that on the one hand, we do have this history of, of refugees and of suffering, which does inspire and motivate a lot of work within the community. Um, in the view that you know it could be us, it was us, and so we should uh, we should try to help other people in that situation. Um, but on the flip side, um, when you frame it in that way, that feeling of historical vulnerability can also turn that into something which becomes more inward looking. Um, and a key pillar of the of the Benazza program is about inspiring outward looking um, uh, social responsibility. So I don't know if you, your experience is so much within the Jewish community, maybe more broadly about getting people to support issues which are mainly taking place far away. Uh, but do you have any thoughts on what is the key for framing these issues in such a way that do inspire action, but action which isn't necessarily limited to self-preservation and which can become more outward looking? Well, that's a very good point, uh, George. And let me be blunt. To the extent that um, global care is a responsibility, we're, we're failing to communicate it or to make it work. Uh, and I don't know who the we is there, but 
Um, uh, so, I, I mean, I guess that's a, a segue to me saying I, I can't tell you the success of that effort. I mean, we're living at a time when big global problems are being more neglected than solved. And uh, when uh, what, what, I, what, 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 um, what you might call the divisions between people are more prominent in discourse than the things that unite them. And when the, the obvious point that um, we all have a responsibility to, to tend to our local circumstances is, is, is it's almost that charity begins at home and ends at home. And that's a very dangerous argument in an interconnected world. So I think that the chief rabbi's commitment to, to thinking globally is, is a really important um, counter push to a global trend. I mean, the fact that he speaks out on the Uyghur issue, for example, is, a, is really important because when when people said after the 90, after 1945 never again it didn't just mean never again for the Jews I mean they meant never again for anyone and I think that's a really so I think it's really important what's my reflection um, and I'm, I'm honestly stumped because if I think you know I don't know how old you are in your twenties if I think back thirty years ago the the, the notion the, the, the obvious point was the world was becoming more interconnected and a more interconnected world needed more global responsibility, regional responsibility, not just national responsibility. Yet uh, over the last 15 years, we've seen the opposite tendency um, predominating. And so the arguments that we've been meeting, making haven't worked, even though I think they're more and more obviously true. So the uh, COVID is the ultimate proof of how connected we are, but so is climate change. Um, uh, ref hosting of refugees is a global public good. Um, and I think that um, the global polling on this is actually less um, terrifying than the Western world polling. The global polling shows that actually there's quite a high degree of social consciousness. You go to Uganda and ask why are they welcoming in the one and a half million South Sudanese refugees, I, which I do, do, and I ask them, they say, well, these are our brothers and sisters and they helped us, so we're going to help them. I mean, it was just a matter of, of course, we let them in. Um, but I think that the challenge for the next 20 years is whether or not the dangers of a hyper-connected world lead to more wall building effectively or whether they lead to more problem common problem solving and that's where i hope in, in its own way your program that you're part of contributes to that i hope to be honest that what maybe a way of, of finishing this ramble uh, will be helpful how am i trying to contribute to it um not through rhetoric uh, the most disabling thing that i think would be if people believe that the problems are insoluble. And so I think that the work that we do and the emphasis that we have on impact is designed to show that actually, if you're willing to put the resources in place, the people in place, the cultures in place, you can make a difference. Because I think what people are suffering from at the moment, if I'm going to generalize awfully, is that it's not that they don't care about what goes on far away, it's they don't think it's soluble. And part of our job as the IRC is to show that these problems are soluble or addressable, maybe, rather than soluble, just to pick up the answer I gave to Lauren's question. Sorry for the long answer. We have time for several more questions. Um, George, did you want to say something? No, no, I'll let someone else ask the question. Moses, you're up next. Sure. Thanks so much, Diana. Um, and, um, George was actually get, getting to, to the point which I, I, I'm trying to get to. Perhaps I could try and uh, re re refine it slightly and get your, your thoughts on particularly the refugee issue, David. Um, my, my name is Moses. I work directly with, with young asylum seekers getting into higher education in the UK. And myself and, and, and many of my colleagues the past few weeks have um, really felt that the recent asylum reforms, the new plan for immigration, really seems to have kind of uh, reinforced the view held by government that being anti-refugee and anti-asylum seeker is electorally profitable. And that is a really kind of strong wave to be pushing against. Um, in your view, and, and with UK politics, you know, how do we invert that equation? How do we 
win the argument? Um, well, if I knew the answer to that, then uh, I'd probably be doing a different job. But the um, uh, what, what are the components? Um, but first of all, if you're working on this, I really urge you to go and study um, the Howard government in Australia in the 1990s, which won four elections in demonizing uh, people coming on boats to Australia. I mean, it's a terrifying story, but it's really worth studying because there's a playbook there that's, that's going to be used by some people without me wishing to um, get into the party politics of this. Um, it, it's worth looking at that. Um, now, I think that uh, the first... I'll say two or three things about the way I approach this, because, of course, in the US at the moment, this whole southern border, quote unquote, crisis is of a piece with the issues that are being raised by migration across the channel or migration into Europe. And um, the, one can go very badly wrong, I think. I mean, the first thing is that I always say to people, look, I'm running a, a humanitarian organization but I think it's imperative that we have a well-managed migration and asylum system. Um, I don't believe in open borders um, and control is absolutely right. Of course, we want to control the number of people coming in, how they're coming in, whether or not they're getting registered, whether they're being vetted, uh, et cetera, et cetera. And the choice I always say to people is not whether there is controls or, or, or no controls, nor is the choice whether they come or not come. The choice is whether or not this is regulated, planned, efficient and humane. And um, I think that that is, if you're not willing to say that, I mean, I always say to people, look, we've got to have, the reason I say efficient, some of you may have raised your eyebrow, why is he saying it's got to be efficient? You need fast processing of asylum claims so that people who have the right to asylum stay and those who don't, don't stay. If you're not willing to say that those who fail their asylum claim can't stay, you can't, you can't win the argument. Um, second point that I think is really important, if you look at the statistics on this, Germany and Sweden are two countries where um, the population, one of the biggest drivers of negative sentiment towards welcoming by their governments was the feeling that other countries weren't pulling their, doing their, pulling their weight. And of course, Again, I'm not going to uh, politicize this, but one of the ironies of leaving the European Union is that the provisions of the Dublin Convention allowed the UK to send asylum seekers back to the continent of Europe, and we're not able to do that under the current arrangements. But um, one country on its own can't step up. You've got to be in, want your country to do the right thing, but you've got to want others to do the right thing as well. There's got to be a, uh, a common responsibility um, on this. Thirdly, I do think you have to address, this is where the roots of the problem start. I mean, for the US at the moment, the Biden administration have announced new plans for engagement with uh, El Salvador, Honduras, and Guatemala. That's right. If you're not, if you don't control the, 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 the if, you, if you haven't got some suasion at source, then people are going to risk everything to get away. And that's why you need an end-to-end -end approach to this, which is much, much easier said than done. However, I think if you have those three elements in place, it's an argument that is manageable. And the proof of that is what's happened in Germany. I mean, they had one and a half million asylum claims they, pro they processed in 2015-16. And it hasn't cost Mrs. Merkel her popularity, actually, because it was well run. And uh, more or less. So, so uh, I, I really don't claim, I'm not fa falsely modest about this. I think it's hard. I, always, I also say to people, look, at the moment, six refugees per parliamentary constituency in the UK. Are you really telling me that six refugees is going to overwhelm South Shields, which is my constituency? Please. You can have five times that number and these still wouldn't be overwhelming. So I think you've got to, you've got to bring the facts to bear as well. There were two more hands. We're going to cluster those questions. So Sari, if you could share your question and then Felicity, and those will be the final questions for David today. Hi, and um, thank you once again to both um, David and the Office of Chief Rabbi. This has been really interesting. Um, my question is just slightly more practical. If um, coronavirus and the pandemic has hindered 
progress you've made or set you back or does it affect have you seen it affect refugees um worse than perhaps citizens of high income countries etc good question and then and felicity if you can chime in as well and then david will respond to both yeah, um, hi. I was just wondering, um, I'm sure there are many unmet needs in the areas that your organisation works in. Um, and I see that you provide things like schooling, nutrition, health education, things like that. Um, but I was wondering how you decided which of these interventions received funding in which areas, as I'm sure most of these areas could benefit probably from most of the interventions. Yeah. And Mikey, do you want to ask your question? You have your hand up. Only if I'm allowed to. Sure. Thank you so much. Um, for, for those of us who aren't anywhere near as impressive as Moses and working directly in the field, what is what's what ways are the most important for sort of regular people in non-NGO, non-international development careers to actually have a positive impact in, in your work and uh, helping the world like that? Great. So, Sarah, on uh, COVID and all that, look, it's been it's not been what we expected. We expected it to be just a massive death toll, um, but it's been much less than we expected, mainly because our populations that we serve are younger and they are outdoors. Sorry to put it like that, but you know, the, the disease doesn't spread outdoors and we didn't, we didn't factor that in. Um, there's probably loads of it and there's lots of asymptomatic. Um, now, what's been much, much worse than we expected is the economic consequences. That's why you've got this 40% increase in um, humanitarian need from, from basically, uh, you know, 40% increase that hit the two th that took you to the 235 million figure. So um, COVID has also made it much more difficult for us to do our work. But I'm incredibly proud. Someone said at the beginning, the chief rabbi said at the beginning, to the, my achievements, I mean, I, I mean, I'm not sure if I'm allowed to disagree with the Chief Rabbi, but they're, they're honestly not my achievements. I mean, I, I, they are genuinely what's being done by 13,000 employees and 17,000 volunteers in 200 field sites around the world. It's their achievements. What we're providing is a scaffolding of outcomes, evidence, value for money, innovation. That's the backbone of the, of the support that we give to help our teams do the right thing. And these are local hires that we have in Syria or in Yemen or um, in uh, Congo, anywhere else. Um, and COVID, what we've had to do is pivot to make sure that we keep our staff safe, not just in health, but in, uh, elsewhere. We have to do a lot more remotely, but there's been some innovation that's come out of that. Um, the, uh, but the needs are growing up not very fast. And um, Felicity, uh, I should have said this uh, uh, at the beginning. I'm not sitting here at the beginning of the year with $900 million of uh, cash and saying, well, we're going to do this in Bangladesh and this in Myanmar and this in Jordan. 75% um, of our money comes from applying to governments for restricted grants. So it's civil servants. Who was one of the civil Someone. One of the first questions was someone who's a civil servant, Dov. It's people like him who are sitting in now the foreign office saying, oh yeah, we'll do teacher training in uh, Pakistan and we'll do a child protection in Syria. And then we decide whether or not to apply for the, the grant. I'd love to have $900 million, uh, but anything else the, 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 to allocate for myself. The transaction costs would be much less, the bureaucracy would be much less, the waste of time would be much less, but that's not the way it works. So the truth is, of our unrestricted money, a very small proportion is fungible to, to say, right, let's, let's throw that million dollars at an emergency response here. Let's throw that million dollars at a new program there. Let's boost the following program. It's a lot of the programs, the, 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 the scaling of the programs depends on government money, not unrestricted money. Maybe if we, we we've changed, I mean, six years ago, 10% of our income came from, was unrestricted. Today, it's about 20%. Uh, six years ago, 10% of our income was from private sources. Now it's 25%. So we're trying to get more private money. And um, we are, uh, and the bulk of that private money, 80% of the private money we raise from individuals, corporations, and foundations is unrestricted, is, is flexible. 
but it's uh, uh, sad to say, philosophy, we don't, uh, we're not able to decide where to put it. Someone else decides. We decide whether to apply for it, and we don't just apply for everything, which is important. And there's a danger for NGOs that they end up applying for where the money is, not whether it's core to their mission. And then that leads me to Mikey's, Mickey's point. Um, what, what can you do? Um, if you're a citizen, you can use your voice. You can use your voice around the kitchen table. You can use your voice in synagogue. You can reuse your voice elsewhere to talk about global responsibility, which I think is important. Uh, if you're an employer, you can make sure that people who are arriving from abroad have a fair shot at getting a, getting a job or getting an internship and getting onto the, um, getting onto the ladder. Um, if you're um, able to be a donor, I've lived in New York for seven years, so this is now easy for me to say. If I, I mean, seven years ago, I would never have been able to say this, but if you're able to be a donor, be a donor and uh, be a supporter of the charities that you um, that, that speak to your values and speak to your interests and speak to um, the kind of efficacy that I've uh, talked about today. I think Trevor Pears is still, hello. Yeah, I, 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 hello Trevor, nice to see you. You're, 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 you're doing a future one of these, I gather. So um, you should learn from him about being a donor. You don't have to learn from me. Or, or you've done it already, have you? I say that's news to me. <laughs> oh, I see. I thought you were going to do one, but yeah. Uh, um, my the, to you. The, you're, the, you're the sponsor of this uh, amazing program. So, um, well, thank you. You, you know, really, you, you can learn from philanthropists, big and small, about how to how to make a difference. And I, I, I think it's important um, to say that. And then I think um, the, the final thing I'd say is think about your skills. I don't know, Mikey, if you're a lawyer or a marketing executive or a strategy consultant um, or a doctor or what, what, whatever your your background is. As a matter of interest, what is your uh, field? Where are you? I'm a scientist, do a PhD. You're, you're a scientist? Yes. In what, in what part of science? Uh, cancer genetics. Wow. Okay, so um, I don't know whether you, uh, this would apply, but whatever your professional expertise, an NGO worth its salt would try to carve out space to be to, to use your ideas and to benefit from what you know. So if you're in AI, we we've we use we, you can help us use predictive analytics. If you're a technology consultant, you can help us create. We we we've, I'm citing things that we've actually done. We created a refugee notice board for people arriving in Greece. A million refugees used our online platform for exchanging information about who to trust and who not to trust. Um, there's a, a range of uh, uh, skills that we, we don't have in-house or we have in-house but could do with more of where, where you can make a difference. And uh, I guess my, my, my final point to you would be, I mean, I hope some of you go and visit the IRC website, which is rescue.org. We've got a London office actually, which used to be our European headquarters but uh, sorry to mention Brexit, but now Berlin is our European headquarters because that's where you know, we get European funding. But the, the UK office is still a vibrant office on the um, advocacy, policy, fundraising, um, communications uh, from visit, visit the IRC um, website. But also think, you know, if this is an era when governments are in retreat from big global problems, then the private sector and NGOs have got to figure out the solutions to those big global problems and then pull the governments along in their slipstream. And that's what, um, that's what we're trying to do. And I, I hope to see you joining us. Thank you. Mikey, I really want to thank you for asking us that question because for me, one of the biggest takeaways from this talk and from your remarks, David, is that while the numbers are large, that this is something that is solvable and that we as individuals can make a difference. In the prep for this session, I had the opportunity to watch several talks that you gave, including a TED talk that I would encourage everybody watch. And one of the um, messages that you shared there that particularly resonated with me is that you said that this is not just a crisis, it is a test of our humanity our character and not just our policies. And so I wanna thank you for sharing that with us and giving us that charge 
um, to really step up to the test of our humanity at this unique moment in time. Thank you so Thank you very, very much for joining us. Very nice to meet all of you. Good luck with it all. Take care.